Hello and welcome. The title of our podcast, Parenting During COVID-19 and Beyond, New Year, Not So New Reality. My name is Dr. Trish Williams. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist at the Hospital for Sick Children and the director of the Neuro Outcomes Lab. Today, we're going to have an update of our parenting podcast from last year. In this podcast, we've re-invited Sarah Cunningham, chair of our Family Advisory Committee for the Neuro Outcomes Lab. Sarah is also a mother and a teacher, and both of us are trying to navigate this life for our families through the pandemic. Today, we're going to have an update and discussing some of the recent findings related to COVID and parenting from our own lab and others. Sarah is going to discuss and describe some strategies on how to work on what we actually can control. And together, we're going to close with a discussion of what we've heard from so many families who've been part of our work in terms of some of the positive benefits of COVID or the unexpected silver linings. Welcome, Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing? How is your family? Good. <laughs> The family is good. The family is good. Consistent feedback from the families that listened to the podcast last year was how reassuring it was to hear other parents like us discuss our own stresses. I think in admitting them and not always acting like experts with all the lists of different strategies. To our listeners, that was appealing. Oh, well, that's good. Because it is. We are falling apart at the seams <laughs> right now. <laughs> And I think that's part of it too, is being able to say, yeah, today was a disaster mm -hmm. and My fa yeah, go ahead. quite possibly tomorrow could be too, but mm -hmm. we're just, you just have to take it as it comes because mm -hmm. as a mom, I didn't sleep the night before their first day of school, not because of my job, but because I was worried about what was going to happen to them and how they mm -hmm. were going to be. Mm -hmm. And they're loving it. And I think being sort of getting that sort of sense of normalcy again, of being able to go to school. Yes, there are different rules, but from being home for last year to being able to be in a classroom with their friends is a huge difference for them. And that's, a, that's, has, that's been their tell me something awesome. It always has to revolve around the social piece, Lovely. which I think really shows how important that social piece is and how it was missing in their development mm -hmm. last year. As you're saying, like the social is, I think in the, in the studies we've done that Sarah you've been part of um, and others larger and across the world it's that social piece that's so leading or driving a lot of the mental health concerns for children mm -hmm. and youth one of the things we've learned um, in the studies that we've done and in, in involving parents of kids with neurodevelopmental disabilities and kids with brain injury that really replicates across many different family situations is the importance of not only the social engagement for our kids, but also how well we're feeling as parents. And that's why in the first podcast, we obviously emphasize the importance of self-care, um, but we're emphasizing it again, but normalizing that no one is alone. And I think one of the things we heard from our families after they listened to the first podcast was how reassuring it was, how overwhelming it was to hear how overwhelming it was for so many other parents and that anger, the guilt, frustration, uh, fatigue, all of those things, you know, and how they impact us, but also how they impact our children. So we're not going to give any prescriptive <laughs> major revelations in terms of how to deal with this other than being patient with, with yourselves, that self-compassion to practice normalizing and knowing you're not alone. There are probably millions of parents out there who are feeling very similarly and how it's important to reach out. I have actually purposely started reaching out to some old friends and there's a Bob Seger song that actually there's a line in it that's, you know, old friends are good for the soul and I believe in it a hundred percent. But it's not just friends. It can be that smile from the stranger at the store, um, reaching out to family members when you need it. And most importantly, your own kids, because the joy we can have with our own kids and taking that time, having special play time or just time where you're taking a break from the expectations of your home, of your work or your, from their studies can be so valuable. So setting those realistic expectations of what we can do. As parents and as professionals, we want to control 
we have this desire and need to feel that we have to control everything that's happening in our lives. And I think if nothing else, this pandemic has taught us that there are some things that we just can't control. Our brains crave predictability. We look for it. We try to control for it. And when we don't have it, it can be quite anxiety provoking. So the uncertainty over the last 18 months has been a major source of the additional stress for families. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or what's going to happen next week, but we should take some comfort in knowing that we can control some aspects. So personally speaking, um, I, as I mentioned before, I am a teacher and the startup of teaching this year was quite different than any that I have ever experienced in my 20 years in the profession. Um, and so there was a lot of anxiety for myself regarding going back to school. I'm also, was, we're, we, my husband and I decided we were sending our own children back after being online for 18 months. So there was an anxiety and a lack of control of what that re-entry into school would look like. So being the type of person that feels that I need to control my situation, I looked for things that I could control. So I don't know if my, my children are going to be online next week learning if schools close. I don't know if I'll be teaching from home in a month's time because of the pandemic. And so I try not to worry about things that I can't control and focus on the things that I can control. Sarah, that's such an important point that I think we need to emphasize that in times where we have such unpredictability, being able to control some things, no matter how small, can be really reassuring both for parents, but importantly for our kids. And one of the things that I can control is being prepared in the event that online learning does happen again. And that doesn't have to be running to Staples or Best Buy and buying devices and supplies, but just even just having a plan of knowing where, what that's going to look like in your household. What is that going to look like for your children? Where are you going to put that computer? Where are you going to get the supplies if, because realistically, the switch from online to in-person, or sorry, in-person to online might happen overnight. And how are we preparing ourselves for that? And I think even just having that conversation and being aware that that is a possibility, you're gaining some of that control back. And I think that it's very easy to say, don't worry about things you can't control. But I think realistically, we do worry about things we can't control. So I like to sort of alter that saying and say, work on what you can control. Maybe not worry about it, but work on it. Have a plan. Think about where you're going to set up your children. Think about what that might look like. And I think just having that sense of expectation or the sense of knowing that it is a possibility will alleviate some of that stress. Do you have any just common sense from your experience as a teacher, but also as a mom of three who had their children home remotely last year, like for, you know, practical things like, you know, that you maybe give to your students or parents to think about in in having that environment ready? So I think the first thing too, is to find a comfortable place. So, and this is one of the silver linings that we were sort of talking about virtual learning because a lot of people and the news and a lot of, it's a lot of negative connotations about virtual learning and being a mom of three who actually thrived last year on online learning I can say that instead of looking at the negatives, let's switch it and look at those silver linings and the positives. So one would be where you choose to do your learning. So I have three children. One is very prim and proper and prefers a desk. So she has a table and and all of her supplies ready to go. My one of my other children is more of the comfy kind of learner. So she has She has a a desk or a spot, but also a place where sometimes she likes to learn while she's lying on her tummy or, you know, in her comfy beanbag chair. And I think that there's no real recipe for uh, that you have to strictly follow for an online virtual learning environment, but it's meeting the needs of your child. And we talked about it before. Parents know their child the best. 
So if you know that your child, you know, requires some movement breaks during the lesson, maybe set, think about setting up their virtual learning environment in a place where there is an area for them to still be engaged in listening to the lesson, but maybe have a space where they can do some of those movement breaks. Simple things. Like I said, it's not a shopping list at Walmart or or a school supply store. It's, you know, knowing what you have at home, what your children enjoy and making it a comfortable place. Because as a teacher, my priority is making the classroom a safe and inviting space for the children to learn. So just think about that when you're setting up your environment, that you want them to be comfortable, you want them to feel safe and be able to do their best work. That's wonderful. And I think as we, we chatted about in our last podcast, but relevant to this current year is monitoring the additional, we're all tired. We're all, there's an even different layer of fatigue and frustration for our families. Um, but I think as, as we move forward, if there are a transition and, you know, we'll have that reaction and, and go into additional stress mode, but at the same time, we survived it last year. It might not have been pretty, but we survived it. As many of our families have reflected amidst, you know, undoubtable stress, that there have been some, as Sarah said, COVID silver linings that our families have shared. The number one, probably across the responses that we've had from our work is the time together as family. Like I know it's excessive, (laughs) but I think there are some times where for a lot of families that it is different kind of time together. It's not the kind of fitting in between schedule things. It's actually time with less running around. I know in our family that it is have us, it has us discussing things that we might not have spoken about before. So the frustration that we talked about that parents feel, um, I think in any other year, not COVID pandemic related, I probably just would have bottled up my frustration and, and, and moved on and not shared it with my children. But I think because we're spending so much time together, they see that frustration. And then we are able to have an authentic conversation about Mm -hmm why I'm frustrated or what about the pandemic is making me frustrated. And it normalizes those worries and those anxieties and their feelings as well. We talk about normalizing feelings between adults, but I think it's also really important to normalize those feelings with your children. And I think being with them Mm -hmm. (laughs) 24-7 gives you that opportunity to say, yes, mommy is having a bad day today. My computer wasn't working and I had to cancel class and, and walk them through what that looks like. But then on the upswing, explain how the problem was worked out or how you were able to overcome that, or maybe you weren't able to overcome it and it was still a terrible day, but you're able to have those discussions with them to let them know that they're probably frustrated because their teacher got kicked out of the Google meet again. And, Mm -hmm. but to share that with them and to say that, Yes, this is what everyone is feeling to let them know that they're not alone. So as much as we talk about to the parents being not alone, I think it's really important for the children to know too that they're not alone. And I know that our board has really put a focus this year on returning to school on that mental health piece about normalizing feelings and speaking about anxieties and really getting to the root cause of how are we feeling about the pandemic and what that looks like at school and, and the various resources that can help. You know, there has been an influx in mental health resources, dedicated staff at school boards who are available and not just in person, but remotely that you can connect with in addition to the more traditional routes for psychological support. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us today to be part of our second podcast about parenting during COVID-19 and beyond. I always love talking with you and learning from your wisdom and insight, both as a parent and as an educator and an advocate. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you to our listeners for joining us for our second edition. And thank you, of course, to our funders, the Canadian Institute of Health Research, Understanding and Mitigating Impacts of the COVID-19 Pandemic on Children, Youth and Families in Canada. 
We also thank the Edwin S. H. Leung Center for Healthy Children for their support. Sarah, do you have any final words of wisdom to impart to our listeners? Just remember, take a breath and have cupcakes for breakfast. (laughs) 